All the escalation that we're seeing around the world is all related to each other. I am quoting a high probability that we see China move on Taiwan before we have a new American president. If I'm in Xi Jinping's shoes, the timing is perfect. The Western world is fractured and chaotic right now. I'm afraid that the U.S. Navy is volunteering itself as a target so that Hezbollah can intentionally drop a missile on a U.S. carrier. Us provoking something is technically our best strategy to get out of this predicament. We need an external enemy. The United States needs a war right now. That's the nightmare scenario that we need to avoid. The leadership in the United States, the leadership in Canada, they know without a doubt that the world is changing, but they cannot tell you and me that. The primary driver behind October 7th was to create the chaos that we're seeing right now. From my point of view, World War III is already happening. Maybe switching the conversation to another theater, and I'm not sure how much you know about North Korea, it seems as though that situation is getting out of control again as well. Uh, they're, they've done uh, record amounts of missile tests. They are creating nuclear weapons. They're increasing their stockpiles. The borders there are becoming uh, the demarcation zone. The agreement they had in 2018 has now been suspended, and both sides are remobilizing at the borders. The U.S. military, of course, is a, a staunch advocate for the South Koreans, and they have a nuclear submarine there now. What is going on there? Why is that situation escalating? So all the escalation that we're seeing around the world is all related to each other. That doesn't mean that there's some mastermind who's coordinating it all. What it means is that there could be some sort of communication or alliance that's contributing to that coordinated escalation or it could just purely be opportunistic. When, when Kim Jong-un sits in North Korea and he sees the United States being stretched as supporting Ukraine, and he sees the United States being stretched you know, economically through the US dollar, when it sees the Western countries distracted, it's the perfect time for them to step up their activities against the entire region, including Japan and South Korea, because they know that the countries that are that are committed to supporting the security in that region are Western democracies. So they're just taking a jab at Western democracies and exploring what their potential is to escalate conflict in South Korea and Japan. The thing is, North Korea participates in these nuclear sideshows, right? These military sideshows. Because what it's trying to do is, is contribute to a narrative that it's controlling within its own country, that it's powerful. Outside of North Korea, we all know the truth. Like, they are not sophisticated. They have a failing economy. They are, they are propped up by Russia and China. Like, it's, it's, a, it's a country that is not sustainable. Unlike Iran, which is a country that is very sustainable, Right. So North Korea's crazy antics are really to make the North, to give them footage and to give them plausible media coverage so that they can say to their own people, we are strong, we will win the conflict against the South, right? Keep in mind that in North Korea, they still believe that uh, the Kim family descends from gods of the sun. So they're, it's, a, it's a different type of world. Could they do something stupid and crazy? Absolutely, Right. Do I believe that they have the ability to execute like a nuclear uh, uh, detonation somewhere? I think it's a low probability that it's sophisticated. It's a medium probability that they have the capability, mainly it would, would most likely be a Chinese capability that the Chinese gave to the North Koreans. But I don't think that North Korea is going to take any action that jeopardizes the Kim family's control of the country. And that's a country that, I mean, most European countries could invade and dominate North Korea within a few weeks because it's such a fractured, broken, you know, uh, prehistoric, dated military and military doctrinal everything. Remember how we were talking about how militaries have to exercise? Yeah. The North Koreans don't exercise. So imagine what it would be like to, you know, oh, step into a boxing ring with a fat guy who talks a bunch of shit but never exercises. Mm -hmm. So it seems like if you're saying that the U.S. can't win a war on two fronts and there's this high-level coordination going on, it starts to look like there's blood in the water, there's 
all the sharks are, are circling and it's only a matter of time before they potentially call the bluff of the United States and they realize that, okay, well, you know, maybe this is our time. And, you know, it's, it's, it seems like there's a real risk that the U S is dethroned in this whole process by the coordination of North Korea, China, you know, Iran, all the four fronts, the main, the big four, right? Ukraine. So, it starts to look like there's a real risk of uh, something kicking off here. I mean, maybe I'm just, it's my prepper pessimism. But if I was these countries, I'd be looking at this situation right now and I'd be saying to myself, this is our time to act. What do you yes, think about I, that? I agree with you. It's, it's not that it's looking like that. That is absolutely what is happening. But here's where I want to challenge the, the Western mindset. In Western thinking, we are always anticipating a, a pivotal moment when everything changes. That is very, very different from what happens in the East. In the East, it's all about the slow, steady bleeding of your opponent. So what we're actually seeing is Eastern methodologies executing against the West successfully. So it's unlikely we're going to see a moment when they take action and they attack. That's not how, that's how we would execute, but that's not how the East executes. Instead, they will continue to bleed us. They will continue to turn us against each other. And they will continue to watch as their own coffers fill. And that's why economists around the world are estimating that by 2033, China is the largest economy in the world and or it is at parity, at equality with the United States. So if China reaches economic parity with the United States, what does that mean for the BRICS nation? They have absolutely eclipsed the West, right? So why would you take the risk of creating an international incident when you could just steadily bleed your opponent until they can't fight back. And wow. that's what our situation is so difficult for the West. We're not used to this kind of attack. We're not used to this kind of thinking. I mean, the United States, we can't elect a president for longer than two terms. Trudeau has been in power for, what, three terms now? With a fourth one on the way? So, Sadly, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so we have this situation where we expect everything to change every three to five years. And that's how we are engineered. It's one of the reasons why we're innovative and why we're uh, creative and why we turn to democracy because there's constant change. But that's not how it works in the East. That's not how Russia works. That's not how China works. That's not how the Koreas work. That's not how, well, not how North Korea works. That's not how Iran works. Right. They, they look at long, steady change. How do we conf uh, have any kind of combat techniques against that strategy. We've been trapped in a five-year budgetary cycle for the last 75 years. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's fascinating the way you break down like the collectivist incremental approach to attrition as opposed to our more pivotal, decisive, uh, decisive shock and awe style approach to things. But it begs the question then, if we, if our leaders know that this is the strategy that's being employed against us, do they do something provocative to, and I'm not trying to get into the realm of conspiracy here, but I'm just, it, and it doesn't even have to be one. It, do they, do they throw the first punch, you know, before we get too weak? Yeah, it's a great question. And one of the things that, uh, that informs your question, one of the reasons why it's such a good question is because the strategy that has worked for the West in the past has always been to create an external enemy. As soon as there's like an external threat, all of the internal division unifies. Like look at what happened on 9-11. We had all sorts of consternation inside the United States. But once the Twin Towers fell down, everybody put their division aside and unified. Same thing happened in World War II. The country was isolationist until somebody woke the sleeping dragon and the whole country came together, right? 
before Pearl Harbor, the United States thought that women were incapable of doing men's work. And then women created the war machine that men used to liberate Europe, right? So the United States and the West is very accustomed to, we need an external enemy to make massive progress, economic progress, social progress, et cetera. So what, what that means is that it's, it's your scenario of us provoking something is technically our best strategy to get out of this predicament. We need an external enemy. So whether that means a special forces team is deployed somewhere specifically to create a conflict, one of the reasons that I'm a little suspicious about the, the, the ships that we send into the Middle East, I'm afraid that the U.S. Navy is volunteering itself as a target so that Hezbollah can intentionally drop a missile on a U.S. carrier or a U.S. frigate, and that will make the United States unify and go to war, right? I'm a little afraid that we're trying to provoke an attack on American soldiers. My biggest concern with Taiwan and China, when we drive our ships between the Taiwan Straits, my biggest concern is that we're doing that to bait China into doing something, even making a mistake, that attacks one of our soldiers and gives us carte blanche to go to war. Because that's what we need. The United States needs a war right now. But the American people will not support a war unless it is unless it is started by an external threat. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, because we know that at some point, like you're saying, 2033, 2027, I mean, whenever China will surpass us, the BRICS nations will surpass us, not only in they'll also surpass us likely in their nuclear capability. And so there, there becomes a point where that whole preemptive strike doctrine starts to look enticing to, and I'm not saying that it's going to come to that, but I'm sure this is something that is wargamed at the highest level. Uh, you know, at what point do we pull the trigger knowing that ultimately we are going to be uh, at, the, at the whim of whatever the Chinese and the Russians and the Iranian uh, axis decides to, to do. You brought up a great word there. You talked about wargaming, right? And I love, I love wargaming. I've always loved participating in war games. And what's fascinating is I learned so much about people through the wargaming process. So let me, I just want to war game with you really quick, just to show you how the process works. Let's, most people think a war game has to do with a war. It's not. A war game has to do, the majority of its focus is on what happens after the conflict. So let's assume that by 2027, China has reached near economic parity with the United States, right? Let's say it's within 10% of the same GDP. If that happens in 2027, what does that mean about China's ability to invest in its nuclear capability, but also in its standard military? I'm not sure. <laughs> I'll let you. <laughs> it means they can invest more. If they can invest more because they're growing and the United States is declining, what does that mean about the United States' ability to invest in its own standing army? That it's going to contract it's going to decrease so now in 2027 we're already seeing the increase in capability of our adversaries and the decrease in capabilities for us now fast forward to 2033 we have parity but for the last five years china's been increasing their investment in their capability we've been decreasing our investment in our capabilities so even though we have economic parity what does it mean for our military parity we are actually not equal and then from that point forward, when China and the BRICS nations produce more GDP than the G20 nations produce, guess what that means for everybody in the BRICS affiliate block? They can all outspend us. They can spend more money on more advanced technology, more troop development, more training, more nuclear weapons, and we have to work on a budget. That's the nightmare scenario that we need to avoid. Because it's not about the point in time when they create more GDP. It's about the trend as we approach that period of time. Because we start to lose the ability 
to secure our long-term primacy. The moment where you see the change in GDP, technically it's already too late. Right. It's like a fait accompli when you have the the contraction of our military and the enhancement of their own. What do you think yes, uh, in terms of the Taiwan-China situation? Is that threat just overblown as well, or is there a real possibility that things kick off there? I still, I still am voting a high probability that we see China move on Taiwan before we have a new American president. If I'm in Xi Jinping's shoes, the timing is perfect. The timing is perfect. You've got the United States overspent in Ukraine. You've got Israel and Hamas taking the world attention. You've got all sorts of political infighting inside the United States, as is. You have the rise of isolationist, nationalist country leadership inside Europe. Like the world, the Western world is, in, is fractured and chaotic right now. It's the perfect time for China to either use military force to invade Taiwan or use a predominant legislative force like they did in Hong Kong to basically acquire Taiwan legally without a bullet, without a bullet fired, right? But the window that Xi Jinping has to do this is narrow. And if he misses this window, then he doesn't really get another chance for another three to five to 10 years. He gives the United States a chance to reconnect or, or uh, circle the wagons, right? To restructure and potentially gain back influence that they've lost in the last five years. But in my opinion, if I'm in Xi Jinping's shoes, you act in the next five to six months, ideally when Americans are actually going to the polls, because that's when the president is the most lame duck. Already, the Speaker of the House and the President are not on the same terms. So the President is not going to get any legislation passed, and the Speaker of the House is not going to get any legislation passed. So the United States is locked up. So the, the, the next best benefit is to take action when it makes the current leadership look weak and failed. And the time to do that is really during the election cycle. Yeah, especially in light of how preoccupied we are in Ukraine and the Middle East. Uh, what do you think the motive is for Taiwan? Is it strictly to contain China, as they call it, or is it a do with semiconductors and economic reasons? Uh, it's got to do with both, plus a third thing, right? So one, the United States knows that if they lose the semiconductor capacity of Taiwan, if that becomes the semiconductor capacity of China, then America's top industry, our top ge GDP generating industry, technology, is no longer under our control. It goes to China. And that's exactly what China's trying to do, is develop their uh, their high technology industry. So for sure, there's an economic benefit to the United States supporting Taiwan. But at the same time, we're also seeing the United States investing in their own indigenous semiconductor capability. So they're separating and diversifying themselves from Taiwan also. But there's a, there's a second and a third element here too. The second element is by containing, by retaining control of Taiwan, we prevent China from ever getting that high technology asset, which means that we are we are intentionally hampering their economic growth, which is economically and militarily beneficial to us. So we do want to contain them by containing their ability to advance economically, which keeps us as the primary economic power of the world. That's two reasons why we want to support Taiwan. But there's a third reason. The third reason is the whole world knows that the United States has promised to secure Taiwan, just like the U.S. has promised to secure Israel. So if we let Taiwan go, we let Israel go, what does that mean for every other alliance we've ever created? It calls into question the reliability of the United States as an ally. When you've got the growth of the BRICS nations, this is the worst time in history to have American reliability questioned. Because you're already seeing American allies bailing on American relationships and joining developing country relationships with the BRICS. So if we actually fail to secure Taiwan or fail to secure Israel, it's going to open a floodgate of African, Latin American and European countries that are like, fuck the U.S. They don't have my back. They don't follow the bro code. And they're going to jump ship and go join the BRICS nations and add their GDP to the collective GDP that 
that we're all afraid of eclipsing the G20. I mean, you would think that nations would already be aware of that in light of what happened with Afghanistan, where one month prior to our departure, they were saying that we'll never <laughs> abandon the Afghani people. So, you know, you think any uh, sane person, Zelensky included, would think to themselves, hmm, is there going to come a time when these guys just jump ship? Like that has to be a something that's in the back of these people's minds, you know? And what you're getting into here is you're getting into the true meaning of propaganda. Your leadership, the leadership of Ukraine, Zelensky, the leadership in the United States, the leadership in Canada, they know without a doubt that the world is changing. But they cannot tell you and me that. Because if they tell us the truth, then that gives us the information we need to make our own choice. And our own choice may not be what the government thinks is the best choice. So they have to engage their own propaganda machine to make sure that the public narrative remains the same. Now, I'm, I'm using the word propaganda in its true definition, which means a crafted political message to drive an outcome. Propaganda is alive and well. We don't like to admit it, but it's very much out there. The difference between propaganda in the West and propaganda in the East is that in the East, they control access to information. So when China and their propaganda department puts out a public statement, they actually control public information to make sure that nothing contradicts their public narrative. In Western countries, we have freedom of information. So when the government crafts a propaganda message, we still have access to independent messages. So what's important for the governments of the West is continuity. They have to constantly come back to the same narrative. They can never let their narrative change. Otherwise, they're showing, they're showing a, flaw, a flaw in the armor. So that's why like you and I, just like, I mean, you said it yourself two minutes ago. It's obvious that countries must see this. Our leadership must know. You are exactly right. Logically and rationally, you are exactly right. But there is no way the president can ever, the president of the United States or the prime minister of Canada, there's no way they can ever come out and tell you and me publicly, hey guys, we're a little bit worried about China and uh, we think we may not be the dominant economic force in a few years. And we don't really have a plan yet, but we're working on it. But please keep me in office and give me four more years to try. <laughs> yeah. They can't this, say that. And this is precisely why I consider myself a, a prepper, because I know full well that continuity of government trumps everything else. And so if we know what you just said, that they're never really going to tell us the truth because uh, it's potentially to the detriment of, you know, keeping the whole ship afloat then, you know, it's the onus is on us to try to decipher what's what and to presume that things might be worse than they're presented to be. Um, I, I guess it's maybe a good time to pivot into that. Uh, do you, what are your thoughts on preparedness, uh, the rise in interest in preparedness as it coincides with the deterioration of events around the world? Do you consider yourself a prepper? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, I do not consider myself to be a prepper in the traditional sense. I consider myself to be a prepper in a more macro sense. And here's what I mean by that. There's something called a social pyramid. Um, I, it's not commonly known. It's relatively well documented in sociological circles. But inside the pyramid, it breaks into three parts. The bottom of the pyramid is individualism, right? It basically means every individual is out for themselves. So think back into like caveman days. Yeah. You ate what you killed. You slept in the bed you made. The good news is that you had absolute control over your day. The bad news is if you were sick for two or three days, you didn't go hunting and you might die from a lack of food. The second tier in the triangle is tribalism. Individuals naturally escalated themselves into tribes. So now you and I are part of the same tribe. So now if you are an awesome hunter and I'm an awesome gatherer, 
we're going to have some fantastic food. But if I get sick for a couple of days, I can eat the food that you bring in. And if you get sick for a couple of days, I can keep the fire going so you don't go hypothermic, right? So there's a benefit of being a tribe rather than being an individual. But at the top of the triangle becomes the state. The idea by going up the triangle is that you are increasing your efficiency per person. Because people who are good at what they do get to do it for more people. But you do that at the sacrifice of individual freedom. Because by the time the state is in power, they trump everything. And now the survival of every individual is is reliant on the survival of the state. So now, because of this sociological principle, it means that every individual in the world is dependent on the state as long as they are in a sociological world where there is an organized state. It also means the state does not care about the individual. The state cares about the state because as long as the state survives, they can serve multiple individuals. So the individual's life matters less. So you're giving up freedom in exchange for more scalable efficiency. So for me, the reason I say all that is because people with a mindset towards preparation are really people who understand that triangle and the truth of that triangle. And they choose whether they want to invest in the state, the tribe, or the individual. And they understand that if the state fails, when the state fails, the next logical step down is tribalism. And it's not really individualism until all hell has broken loose. So preppers, depending on what type of prepper they are, sometimes they prepare to operate in tribes. Sometimes they prepare to operate as individuals. But in both cases, what they need to understand is that the state will always be in conflict with the prepper's objectives. Because in by virtue of what the prepper is doing, it makes the state look like the state will not always be in control. And that's not what the state wants. Yeah, I mean, we've done videos before where we talk about how those things are always at odds, you know, uh, whether it's in terms of your ability to grow your own food without FDA oversight or your yep. ability to own firearms and things of that nature. So uh, that was excellent the way you <laughs> just in one minute, you just explained it all. That's amazing. Uh You've talked about like homeschooling on your channel before. Um, You know, is is that part of the reason why you do that? Or why do you homeschool? Everything that that I do personally, I try to do it in a way where I separate myself from dependency on the state. Because I don't ever want to let myself fall victim to the narrative of the state. But I also want to maximize the individual opportunities of myself and my children. So one of the things that I think is super important to understand, first of all, like the whole idea of political opposites, liberals and conservatives, that idea is is born, it's constructed by the state. We are all a little bit liberal and a little bit conservative. So the longer that we let ourselves, uh, you know, think of, Think of or subdivide ourselves into liberal or conservative, the more we're just doing what the state is telling us to do, right? So for me, it's all about opportunity. I want my children to have opportunities I don't have. And I also want my children to have opportunities in a future that I can see is becoming higher risk and lower reliability. So I have to do what I can do now to prepare them for that future. If I do, if I let the state educate my children, I'm not preparing them for the future. I'm not preparing them for opportunities. I'm conditioning them with what the state wants them to know and what the state has regulated. That's, yeah. I don't, that's not me saying that I'm afraid that my children are going to be brainwashed. I am absolutely afraid that my children are going to lose the opportunities that come with independent critical thinking if I let them be educated by the state. My wife and I have absolutely raised our own food in the past, and we have plans to get to a place where we can raise our own food in the future, right? Again, we want to separate ourselves from dependence on the state. We want to live off the grid. 
we want to be completely unknown. I'm in my perfect world, Nate. In five years, you can't even find me. But this is my window of time now to tell the world what I believe, what I see happening, what I'm doing, so that they understand in five years why you can't find me. Yeah, you just articulated the Hegelian dialectic as a tool of social control by the state. And uh, I really like the perspective that you just shared there with respect to, you know, you basically describe yourself as a prepper, but not in those terms, which I think is important because there's all sorts of stigma that comes along with that terminology that we're trying to avoid as we try to encourage people and using the right words to take that more independent mindset uh, yeah. that isn't necessarily what? about isolating yourself. It's about preparing for the future as well. And thriving, you use yes. that word a lot, is thriving. And maybe you could touch a bit uh, about that. No, that's I, I completely agree with you. Preppers, the idea of a prepper has been stigmatized. And and now people assume that that if someone is a prepper, it means that they're scared. They're scared of what the future brings and they're scared of their neighbor and they think everyone is out to steal their money, their food, their wallet, whatever. Preppers are not scared. Preppers are not people who wake up afraid. They are people who understand the value of opportunity. And they understand that the actions they take today limit their opportunities in the future. So prepper is really all about opportunity, but the, the wider world has isolated or marginalized them into this, this scared group of crazies. And it's just, it's ridiculous because any intelligent individual is always valuing preparation because they value opportunity. So whatever the contributing factors are to the stigma of preppers, it only hurts the long-term growth and expansion of prepper mindset, right? Which is a mindset of opportunity and anticipation. Yeah, and I like that you bring the, the thriving component and the, the more optimistic, while you have a, uh, perhaps, I don't want to say bleak outlook for the present and the immediate future, you still talk a lot about uh, the potential positive outcomes, the silver lining at the end of all of this. And, you know, where do you see, I guess, after the smoke clears, the dust settles, what are some of these opportunities and what sort of services do you provide at uh, everydayspy.com? Yeah, I mean, I, I love that you're connecting this for me, right? Because the whole reason I created my company, the whole reason everydayspy.com exists is to give people elite skills, elite tools, elite tactics, the same stuff CIA gave us to always be prepared. We now have an opportunity to share with other people through everydayspy.com. So whether you're trying to prepare for a better career or whether you're trying to prepare to, to have physical security in a dangerous world, whether you're trying to prepare your children to defend themselves physically against bullies, Whatever it is that you're trying to prepare for, Everyday Spy is there with CIA level skills, tactics, and training to help people learn those skills. And we have democratized it by making it a digital platform. So you don't have to be in the United States. You don't have to come to one of our events. You can literally go to the website from anywhere. You can purchase with any number of tools, whether it's PayPal or credit cards or you know, wiring money. We want to democratize the availability of the information that allows people to maximize future opportunities, right? The mission of Everyday Spy is to use spy education to break barriers. That is what wakes me up at night, man. It's what keeps me awake at night. <laughs> it's all I care about because when I went to CIA, I was expecting like fast cars, beautiful women in suits and tuxedos. And instead, what I got was systematic training in how to handle any future occurrence with, with dignity and grace and control. And that was so powerful to me because that made it so I could operate in Africa or Latin America or Europe. I could even execute operations in the United States against terrorists because I could always stay one step ahead of my threat. So that's what Everyday Spy is all about, everydayspy.com and all of the content we create on YouTube, on podcasts, this interview that I'm having with you, 
my, I mean, it's all about the mission of giving people the opportunities that they're looking for to break the barriers that they see. That's uh, fascinating. I'd encourage people to go and check that out. What sort of, if you could just give us maybe one tip that you would give to preppers, like let's say, you know, shit hits the fan, Mad Max, uh, what is maybe just something people can keep in their heads uh, from your perspective in terms of how to navigate uh, adverse circumstance that we've never been exposed to before? So I'm going to give I'm going to give three tips. My first, and there, some of them you're going to find silly, and hopefully one of them is valuable. Right? Tip number one: only ever wear closed-toed, laced shoes. Shoes. So only ever wear closed-toed, laced shoes. You can see my my mouth can't wrap my way around it, right? Because no matter what shit hits the fan, if you got closed toes and laces on your feet, you're safe. I have seen way too many bad guys neutralized because they're fighting in flip-flops or sandals or some other shit. And as soon as like asphalt breaks and grass breaks and cement is falling down, your feet are fucked. Your fighting days are over. We'll always wear closed toed shoes with laces. Number two, carry small denominations of U.S. dollars. Because when the economy goes to shit, a $5 bill is going to be worth much more than $5. So if you only have 20s, 10s, 20, $100 bills, then you're going to be overpaying for everything because no one's going to give you change. So you need to carry small amounts of, of currency because as soon as the banks shut down, every piece of currency massively increases in value. So I always encourage people to carry $200 in cash, US dollars in cash. Not Canadian I dollars. I recommend you carry those in small denominations. What about Canadian dollars or Turkish lira? I would do the same thing with all of it, man. Keep everything <laughs> okay. in, small, in small amounts. Because here, yeah. here's the thing. If you're in Turkey and you're trying to get out of Turkey, guess what the most important currency is going to be? So do you think uh, USD would still be universally recognized as superior to those in those situations? You would take lira over USD in some cases? As long, well, no, no. As long as, the, as long as US dollars are the dominant economic force, yeah. you want to use those. Okay. We don't, we don't stand the risk of losing US dollar dominance until we start reaching parity with some other economic power. So 2027, 2029, 2031, that's when you have to really keep an eye on what currency is going to be. But currency valuations change much slower than we think, yeah. right? Because there's momentum behind them. So get your hands on US dollars, have them in small denominations. That's tip number two. Tip number three, the only self-defense weapon you need to be a master with is some kind of baton or some kind of physical bat or some, some stick that you carry with you because it never runs out of ammunition. It never runs out of batteries. It ca you carry it with you everywhere you go. And you will always have an advantage over a foe who is untrained in their weapon if you are very comfortable and familiar with your weapon. So if someone attacks you with a knife or a gun and you have a collapsible baton, it becomes a matter of who's more capable with their weapon. Because one strike to the wrist with your baton and now you have a knife or a gun. And that's one of the core things that we're taught at the agency is proficiency with simple weapons rather than proficiency with complex weapons because a complex weapon also has more complex ways that it can fail. So speak softly, carry lots of cash with a big uh, ass closed toed shoes and a big ass stick. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I will party with you any day if you carry those things with you. Right on. Well, you can be sure that I definitely have a few uh, means, uh, more primitive means of self-defense at my disposal because here in Canada, we can't uh, conceal carry. So we yep. pretty much have no choice. Um, I know. What... That's what it's like in most of the world, man. It's fucked up. Yeah. In most of the world, the only tool you have to defend yourself is what you carry in your own hand that, yeah. that isn't a projectile. I have one last question for you, because I know our time is limited here today. And I wanted to ask you a few more questions about intelligence services and stuff. But I'll just ask you this one. What are some misconceptions people have about the CIA and becoming a member of the CIA? The, so I love this question, man. And thanks for letting me answer this. The number one misconception that people have about CIA is that it is a secret organization that works against American interests. It's just not true. Everything about how CIA operates, everything is policed 
by U.S. legislation. We're, we operate within the confines of the judicial system and the legislative system within the executive branch. Now, there are certain areas where the executive, meaning the president, has the ability to exercise his use of CIA without judicial or legislative approval, but that's a very narrow strip. So the wider CIA, the bulk of every CIA officer that you do and don't know, we are all there to serve the American people. And that's the same truth with every intelligence service within the Five Eyes Nations, CSIS, MI6, the ACES in Australia. We are there to serve the people. And there's only a small space where the executive powers can execute us for anything else. So you haven't had any sort of uh, top secret uh, run-ins with aliens or anything like that? Not that I can talk about. <laughs> All right, man. Andrew Bustamante, thanks for coming out. We uh, greatly appreciate it. I would encourage people to go and subscribe to his YouTube channel. Excellent information, condensed. If you like what you heard today, you know, you're know you going to get a lot more of that. And uh, we hope to have you back in the future if you're willing, because I have a feeling that uh, things are only going to be getting more uh, precarious, at least in the short and medium term, before uh, we approach that silver lining phase of things. So thanks again for coming out, my friend. My pleasure, brother. And I hope next time to see you in your own studio up in Canada. Yeah, absolutely. I look forward to that. All right, take care. Take care. The best way to support this channel is to support yourself by gearing up at CanadianPreparedness.com where you'll find high-quality survival gear at the best prices, no junk, and no gimmicks. Use discount code PREPPINGGEAR for 10% off. Don't forget, the strong survive, but the prepared thrive. Stay safe.